time. Welcome to today's program, the Regulatory Cooperation Council Action Plan at Six Months, brought to you by the Wilson Center's Canada Institute and, and the program on the America and the Global Economy. And I'm very happy today to welcome the U.S. Chamber of Commerce as our co-sponsor of today's program. I'd like to spend, extend a special welcome to you here in the room, to those of you watching the webcast, and those of you in the future watching the, uh, the film. I'm David Biet. I'm director of the Wilson Center's Canada Institute. Um, just for some background, the Wilson Center was founded in 1968 by an act of Congress as the official memorial to the 28th president, our only president with a PhD. At the center, we build a bridge between the worlds of public policy, business, and academia to inform and develop solutions to the nation's problems and challenges. And I would put this issue in that category. Today's program is part of the Canada Institute's initiative to spotlight the Beyond the Border Action Plan and the Regulatory Cooperation Council Action Plan. On July 9th, we held a program similar to today's that looked at the Beyond the Border Action Plan with the two uh, Canadians and Americans to, to talk about that. We want to keep an open dialogue on these processes and have a blog, our page is there on the screen, the Beyond the Border Observer that tracks the progress of both the Beyond the Border Action Plan and the Regulatory Cooperation Council action plan. The blog is an aggregator of news, press releases, scholarly articles and speeches, and official documents related to the RCC <coughs> and the action plan. Our hope is that the observer will be the only resource you need to follow all the developments of these two vital programs. So stay tuned. We'll be looking at more of these issues in detail as in the coming months. And just an FYI and add on August 8th, we will have a program with several other programs at the Wilson Center on the TPP. Um, including Canada, the United States, Mexico, and other countries. Adam Schlosser, right here to my left, Senior Manager of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's Center for Global Regulatory Cooperation, will serve as today's moderator. And we do hope to have a lot of back and forth and some questions uh, between you and the, uh, the panelists. So please wait for the microphone. We'll need that for the, the webcast. Um, and please identify yourself when the microphone comes to you. But first, I'd like to turn it over to Patrick Kilbride of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to say some introductory words. Patrick. <coughs> Great to have you, sir. Thank you, David. Yeah. Thank you, David, very much. And uh, thank you to all of you for, for your interest in this important topic. I, I just want to, on behalf of the U.S. Chamber, uh, and I'm the Senior Director for the Americas uh, at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, say thank you to uh, the Wilson Center and to the Canada Institute and David Biet in particular for their leadership on these critical issues. Uh, you know, at the U.S. Chamber, we believe that uh, the U.S. partnership with Canada is one of the critical keys to our economic su success in the global economy. We share a 4,000-mile border. We share nearly $2 billion a day in, uh, in global goods trade. And uh, we share a deep set of common interests, values, and opportunities. And so this, this uh, regulatory cooperation initiative, the border uh, perimeter initiative, the TPP are all critically important. One of the benefits uh, to having such a close partner is that you can observe how different countries approach different problems. And at the chamber, uh, we've observed that Canada has done a lot of things right over the last couple of decades that have really set it up for success in the global marketplace. And so uh, David was kind enough to give me an opportunity, excuse me, to uh, advertise a, a program we're doing next Tuesday uh, that will look specifically at some of the things that Canada has done right in, uh, in terms of fiscal policy, in terms of tax reforms, in terms of energy policy and so forth. And so I'd just like to invite everybody to join us uh, at the chamber on uh, Tuesday morning uh, with uh, the president of the Canadian chamber, the president of the U.S. chamber, and, uh, and several other uh, Canadian officials uh, for that program. And David, thank you so much. Thank you, Patrick, and good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for coming today. <coughs> we have a really exciting program in front of us. Uh, we're lucky to have Bob and Alex here, and they're very interested to hear a lot of questions and input from those of you in the audience. Uh, my name is Adam Schlosser. I work for the Chamber's Center for Global Regulatory Cooperation. Uh, we're strong supporters of international regulatory cooperation, uh, and that leads to better regulations overall, 
uh, benefits for businesses, consumers, and regulators alike. It's not just about aligning the regulations themselves, but it's about becoming more efficient through regulatory actions, such as information sharing, uh, sharing of other resources as well. And the U.S. counter relationship is unique in that we share a lot of the same cultural values. Uh, we share a border, nearly, or well over $1 billion a day flow across the border to both sides. Our supply chains are vastly integrated. Components go back and forth across the border many times before arriving at the final product that's often sold to the other side of the border. Our automotive, our, our autos travel freely <coughs> back across the borders. <coughs> and we breathe the same air, we eat the same food, we demand the same levels of protection from our regulators. Uh, therefore, in 2011, the RCC action plan was released and it contained 29 sector specific initiatives. And these were developed with a lot of input from stakeholders. They were chosen because they were feasible plans and we could reach tangible results in a two year time frame, which is very important. There's actually a concrete plan moving forward towards uh, an end goal. And each of these work plans are, are now available uh, online. And uh, in January, we had our first stakeholder event over two days in Washington, D.C. Uh, and this is, uh, we're now at the mark of six months. So uh, we're here to provide an update on the actions. Uh, and first, we're going to have Robert Carberry speak. He was appointed to the United States Canada Regulatory Cooperation Council at the Treasury Board of Canada's Secretariat. Uh, Bob has significant experience in regulations, domestic and international issues management, and market access negotiations. He obtained a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture degree from the University of Manitoba and an MBA from the University of Ottawa. He's also a certified management consultant. He has private sector experience as a president of a sportswear manufacturing company and as an owner and director of a sporting goods business. Thanks very much. <coughs> Thanks everybody for coming out today. It's, uh, I think what we're seeing is an ongoing and increasing interest in the exercise that we're undertaking. What I'd like to do is give you a bit of background as to uh, how we got to where we are, then a few comments about how um, you can help us moving forward over the next several months. Um, this exercise in regular co regulatory cooperation isn't uh, just a new wave of regulatory principle that we want to try to uh, put across the, uh, the board. It really is founded in North American competitiveness and the real practical aspects and understanding that there are a number of requirements out there that industry is feeling on a daily basis and there's costs in the system that are truly unnecessary. And we feel that some of those can be removed while still achieving our health and safety outcomes and respecting our own uh, individual privacy and sovereignty uh, preferences. Um, we really do have uh, a unique situation between Canada and the U.S. And uh, some of you have heard me say before that uh, one of the ways that we can kind of look at this is to say, since the time of covered wagons, we've had an economy that's been gradually integrating, um, both on a regional level and on a national level, with supply chains, as Adam said, zigzagging across the border on a daily basis, but bumping into regulatory requirements um, every time those products move across. At the same time, we've been building this integrated economy both Canada and the U.S. have been highly successful in building independent but highly high-performing regulatory regimes. Um, the problem is when we built those independent regulatory regimes, we didn't formally anticipate that we would potentially have a fully competent and successful partner on the other side of the border. So there's very few institutional bridges built into the regulatory systems that would allow for uh, a higher degree of confidence and a recognition of the work that's happening on the other side of the border. That being said, given the fact that we have an integrated economy and two highly successful regulatory regimes, we're in a very unique situation where we can actually leverage that and turn it into something called regulatory cooperation that will ease some of the burden, we think, for uh, industry. Those systems themselves, uh, said another way, and uh, example that I've been using since March is I took my son to the Alamo, um, San Antonio, at spring break. <clears throat> when I was down there, it struck me that I have no concerns about breathing the air, drinking the water, eating the food, renting and driving a vehicle, or buying over-the-counter drugs for that matter. And that's because I know that the regulatory system in the U.S. works. So as citizens, we understand that. And I know when <coughs> U.S. visitors come to Canada, they have the same level of confidence. The problem is our regulatory systems don't recognize it, even though the citizens do. And that's really what we're trying to work on right now, is building things into the regulatory system 
that would bring it up to the point where we can recognize the good work that's gone on in the other jurisdictions. So we went through quite an exercise, announced December 7th this 29 item action plan, uh, and since then we've been working very hard with the regulatory departments to build work plans for each one of those action plans. And what you'll see in those, in those, in those work plans, in almost all of them, um, is uh, both the de facto issue that we want to have resolved, but also a seed uh, that indicates we also want to work on these ongoing systemic solutions. And that is uh, going to be a real uh, focus for us over the next several months. The work plans are now on the web. I would invite you to take a look at them. They do have both these elements on them. Uh, and if you look at it in terms of the ongoing systemic uh, mechanisms we want to build, this is a bit of a laboratory. Uh, because we really want to explore where we might be able to go between regulatory agencies to make a whole bunch of these unnecessary requirements go away and to build those more institutional bridges. Now, we're seeing this work uh, occur in four general areas of regulatory business. Uh, we're seeing it at cooperation on the perimeter so we can jointly address the risks that are f coming at us from third countries. We're looking at uh, joining forces and partnering in standard setting, in product approvals, and then an overall reliance on the outcome that's been achieved in the other jurisdictions. So what this really means is we're looking at new forms of mergers or partnerships between our regulatory experts and our regulatory systems that would allow us to come up with, uh, with joint approaches that we would recognize on each side of the border. Now in doing this exercise, and that's why it's a bit of a laboratory, we know that there's real practical limitations right now because of existing authorities, policies, administrative requirements to making some of that happen. As I said before, we didn't anticipate the institutional bridges that we might want to bridge uh, or might want to build when we set up our regulatory systems. So what we're asking the regulators to do and what we're going to ask you folks to do is to join in that discussion and explore what might a better level of cooperation and partnership actually look like, notwithstanding some of the current limitations to the authorities, the policies, and the, uh, and the administrative requirements. Because we really want to look beyond that and then use this exercise to sit back, take a look at what we need to change so that we can build these higher level of this higher level of cooperation and then undertake to do that. So um, at this point in time, we really need some acute industry attention, uh, frankly, uh, on the working groups and in the Regulatory Cooperation Council's work in general. Uh, we've uh, been down, I've been down here a number of times meeting with uh, U.S. colleagues. Uh, we've been doing a lot of meetings with uh, Canadian industry, and people have been saying, when do you want us to engage? How can we engage? The answer to that is now is the time, and the best way to engage is really two fronts. There's the working group leads. There's a working group lead at the ADM, very senior level, both in Canada and the U.S. We've committed to allowing you folks in the door to have discussions about how things are going and to put ideas on the table. Uh, I ask you to take up, th take up that challenge and contact those working group leads and get yourself involved in the process. And there's also an opportunity to talk to us about regulatory cooperation writ large beyond those work plans that uh, we're very interested in, 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 in getting your views because we have to make some decisions about the types of recommendations we'll be making forward, uh, making about moving forward over the next several months. So um, that's really where we're at right now. I've been asked to keep it short, so I will, but I will welcome your questions in a few moments. Thanks, Bob. And uh, just as a quick plug for my friends with the Department of Commerce, all the work plans are available at trade.gov slash RCC as well as the contact information for the working group leads. Uh, you can find that there as well. Uh, next, we have Alexander Hunt. He is the branch chief in the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, that's OIRA, within the U.S. Office of Management and Budget. As chief of OIRA's Information Policy Branch, he is responsible for the development and oversight of the U.S. government policies and practices relating to open government, privacy, records management, standards, and related information policy issues. Alex also helps to lead the U.S. government's regulatory cooperation initiatives with Canada, Mexico, and the European Union. He currently serves as a U.S. delegate to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, Regulatory Policy Committee, and the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Economic Committee. Alex? Thank you, Adam, and thank you to the Wilson Center for organizing this event. What I'd like to do now that Bob has provided an update on the RCC at, at six months is talk about uh, briefly an important development in the U.S. that provides a formal framework for regulatory cooperation with Canada and other key U.S. trading partners. 
And that's the issuance in May of this year of Executive Order 13609 on promoting international regulatory cooperation. The, the rationale for the new executive order is essentially the rationale for, for the RCC in that it recognizes that uh, domestic regulation now occurs on a, a global playing field where markets and supply chains are global and our customers, the customers of U.S. businesses are outside of U.S. borders. And it focuses on unnecessary regulatory differences between U.S. regulations and those of our key trading partners, recognizing that if we're able to identify, prevent, or address these unnecessary regulatory differences, that we can promote economic growth and job creation, which is an obvious priority of the Obama administration right now. It also recognizes that international regulatory cooperation supports the the regulatory missions of U.S. agencies to the extent that through regulatory cooperation with other countries that the U.S. can promote good regulatory practices such as public participation in rulemaking, regulatory impact assessment, we are uh, better positioned to ensure that our approaches are adopted abroad and therefore there's, uh, uh, these are mutually supportive uh, goals promoting regulatory or ensuring regulatory protections at home while uh, ensuring our, or increasing our access to, to markets abroad by, again, addressing these unnecessary regulatory differences. So turning to the goals of Executive Order 13609, uh, it starts with uh, a connection with another executive order issued by President Obama in January of 2011. 13.563 on improving regulation regulatory review. OIRA's administrator, Cass Sunstein, describes this executive order as a sort of constitution for regulatory policy in the United States. And it, it sets out basic objectives uh, of ensuring that regulations in the United States provide important health, safety, and environmental protections while promoting economic growth and job creation. So the, the executive order, the new executive order ties into those objectives and uh, makes the connection between domestic efforts to reduce unnecessary, unjustified regulatory burdens to addressing the unnecessary differences between U.S. and non-U.S. regulations. It also uh, consistent with the, the goals of Executive Order 13563 calls on agencies to, to pursue joint regulatory approaches with our key trading partners that are at least as at least protective as those regulatory outcomes that would happen in the absence of such cooperation. So it's a strong signal that international regulatory cooperation will not lead to a so-called race to the bottom. Next, let me touch on some of the, uh, the, the, the new requirements and uh, changes that will result from impl implementing 13609. First, in terms of internal coordination of rulemaking in the United States, the executive order calls on an existing interagency inter body, the Regulatory Working Group, which was established in another executive order signed by President Clinton in 1993, Executive Order 12866, which remains in place and it's the, uh, gives OIRA the authority to conduct centralized review of, of significant draft regulations. The, the Reg Working Group, which up until now, um, like the executive orders, that uh, govern centralized review has had a domestic focus. But now we want to use the regulatory working group as a forum to discuss our efforts with Canada and the RCC and other bilateral and multilateral initiatives to, to, uh, to advance regulatory cooperation and the goals of the executive order, including strategies, ways to share best practices that advance and promote good regulatory practices abroad. 
turning to what agencies will be required to do under the executive order, I'll mention three key uh, areas of work, transparency, retrospective review, and considering non-U.S. approaches to, uh, to regulation. First on transparency, the executive order relies on another existing mechanism, which is our annual regulatory plan. Each agency issues the regulatory plan in the fall. It lays out in a, at a high level each agency's regulatory priorities and strategies over the coming year. And for the first time, these regulatory plans will discuss international activities that the agency plans to conduct that are reasonably anticipated to lead to significant regulations i.e. those regulations that would be subject to formal OIRA review under Executive Orders 12866 and 13563. So again, making a connection between this new international uh, focus and the, the longstanding domestic regulatory uh, program. Second, the Executive Order ties into another uh, very important and significant initiative in the Obama administration, which is retrospective review. Last year's executive order, 13563, as well as a, a more recent executive order, um, 13610 on retrospective review, is institutionalizing a, uh, a process in each agency where on an ongoing and regular basis with input from the public, reviewing existing regulations to identify those that are outmoded, unjustifiably burdensome or insufficient, and uh, reforming those regulations. What the executive order on international regulatory cooperation call on agencies to do is to uh, include in their retrospective plans regulations that address unnecessary regulatory misalignments with other countries when stakeholders provide evidence data to the agency that uh, convinces the agency that such uh, reform is, is justified. So again, there is another opportunity uh, signal to public stakeholders that your input is, uh, is a crucial component to successful international regulatory cooperation. And finally, with respect to the consideration of non-U.S. regulatory approaches, the executive order calls on agencies to look at the RCC work plans and consider the, alter the, uh, the approaches outlined in those work plans when issuing regulations that uh, touch on those, those issues. Right now, uh, there are only two work plans that uh, trigger that requirement in 13609. Uh, we have two RCCs, one with Canada, obviously, and one with Mexico. But this uh, requirement contemplates future RCCs and future work plans that would also uh, need to be considered by agencies as they, as part of their rulemaking process, consider alternatives to address regulatory problems they've identified. And let me finish with, um, with four lessons learned uh, o over the past few years of experience with international regulatory cooperation. First, high-level political support and leadership is essential, and I think the U.S.-Canada RCC is a perfect example of that where we've had Prime Minister Harper and President Obama personally publicly tasking both governments to do this work and together announcing on December 7, 2011, the RCC Action Plan. Second is uh, the need to focus on areas where with the best prospects for success and where the net benefits are highest. So uh, the RCC Work Action Plan reflects uh, careful consideration of public comments we receive, consultations, within each government, between the between OIRA and our regulators, between Treasury Board and the Canadian ministries, and between the Canadian and American regulators to identify 
that subset of issues that are most likely to produce uh, positive results, which I would mention uh, means avoiding trade irritants. There, there's a lot of issues that are being dealt with bilaterally, but we want this effort to focus on areas where there's potential for success. Third, uh, in transparency is essential and public participation is essential. So events like this, uh, the mechanisms for public engagement that are described in the work plans that are published online are uh, crucial elements to, uh, to this work. And finally, a focus on the long term is very important. I feel like we're sort of at the end of the beginning of this effort with with RCC, there's a tremendous amount of work to be done, and uh, it's helpful, at least for me, to to think long term, understanding that if we are going to be talking about regulatory cooperation years from now, we need to be successful in the near term. So, with that, I'll turn it over to Adam and hopefully uh, have some good questions to answer. Thanks. Thank you very much for uh, for your comments, Alex, and thank you, Bob. Uh, we have plenty of time for questions and answers, so I'll turn over to the audience, and, and please uh, feel free to ask away. Dave Jones, uh, I'm a retired Foreign Service officer. I have a couple of questions. First, uh, how many regulations have actually either been eliminated or uh, made coincidental between our countries in these first six months. And secondly, although it's not necessarily likely uh, or even uh, realistic, if there is a Romney administration uh, next year, to what extent uh, have, the, uh, have the Romney people uh, bought into this? Or is it going to be one of these exercises where not invented here uh, becomes the overwhelming uh, result of uh, of having done a year's worth of work and then it's all set aside. Thank you. Sure. So thanks very much. Um, I'll try to tackle that and I'll leave the questions on the Romney administration to my U.S. colleagues. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, when we, in terms of how many regulations have actually changed at this point in time, it's just been too early. Uh, but I will use this as an opportunity to say uh, it's not just about changing regulations but also the approach we use to to enforce our regulations. And I've made the point in the past with folks saying even if we had carbon copy regulations across the board in agriculture and environment in motor vehicles between Canada and the U.S., we would still have a whole bunch of requirements to meet at the border. So what we're trying to do is get agreements to say um, the way that we will uh, confirm that regulatory outcomes have been met um, is going to be through some different mechanisms at this point in time. So verification procedures, we can probably stand down from some of those if we do something else, those kinds of things. So a lot of this exercise isn't going to be about formally changing regulations. It may in fact be using the existing regulations, but find ways to administer them in more of a partnership approach. So if you look at things that we do with the perimeter, for instance, we're likely not going to be changing our individual regulations around that, but we certainly can partner in how we want to approach enforcement of that so that we don't have to redo things at the Canada-US border. So we're really looking at, at those kinds of things. In terms of the, uh, I will speak to the, the question about um, the government changing down here in terms of general public policy and why regulatory cooperation makes sense because we do get asked that question a lot. Really what this exercise is all about is recognizing the fact that we have a number of experts on both, the, uh, both sides of the Canada-US border and they're both trying to achieve the same kinds of things. What we're trying to do is to get them to, to join forces, if you like. So instead of having 10 regulatory experts uh, building a motor vehicle standard in the U.S. and another 10 or probably six in the Canadian circumstance trying to build uh, the same kind of standard in, the US, in, in Canada, obviously they're not going to end up in precisely the same place, and that creates problems for the auto, automotive manufacturing industry. What we'd like to do is get that 10 and 6 to work together build a standard once. So that does create some work sharing, some partnering, those kinds of things, still leaving the ultimate decision in each jurisdiction, but it creates some efficiency in the regulation. And if you can actually create some efficiencies there, you can turn your resources in both Canada and the U.S. that you, you save on that towards areas of higher risk. So we're really looking at this as being an opportunity to create efficiency and greater effectiveness within the regulatory communities both in Canada and the U.S. 
As we do that, because of the integrated nature of our economy, it could have real immediate and tangible benefits for products moving back and forth across the U.S. border and the Canada border. So if, in fact, we're doing it something, something that works within existing investment, doesn't require any more money, gets better use of that investment through greater efficiency and effectiveness, and has an immediate tangible benefit for the North American industry on both sides of the Canada-U.S. border, we think that's probably going to be something in public policy that's going to be supported by whatever government's in place, either in Canada or, or wherever. So we just think from a public policy standpoint, it makes good sense. And what we understand is that there is uh, down here a lot of interest in regulatory streamlining, efficiency, those kinds of things. There certainly is in Canada. We don't see that going away. We see this thing having legs for those reasons. Uh, my perspective on that is as a civil servant in the executive office of the president who's serving his, his third president, and without hazarding a guess as to how future administrations will deal with this issue, I'll just agree with Bob that the, uh, the, the rationale, the, the realities of the economic relationship will not change significantly as we uh, move forward. And you know, I worked on the Security and Prosperity Partnership in the previous administration. I'm working on the RCC now. I would, uh, I would expect that some form of cooperation w would continue just uh, based on, again, the, the reality that we have uh, such an integrated uh, economy and uh, the volume of trade is, is, is so high. Thanks. <clears throat> and I can say from uh, an industry standpoint, cooperation is a nonpartisan issue. Uh, everybody supports better regulations in the end, more efficient allocation of resources, and an elimination of trade irritants. And, uh, Bob, you mentioned the perimeter uh, briefly. Do you guys mind uh, touching upon the Border Action Plan, how it uh, supports or, or similar to the RCC, how it's different, how they work together overall? Um, th that's not quite at that point. We're about to jo in Canada, by the way, we're about to join with the border group, mm -hmm. so there's going to be a lot more consistency um, across the board. But in general terms, um, they're looking primarily at uh, some of the regulations related to um, border traffic itself, notwithstanding what the commodity might be. We're looking mostly at the commodities. They're looking at people. We're looking more at goods. So there's, there, there's good alignment, and I think what you'll see is some real coherence um, coming out in terms of our messaging over the upcoming couple of months. Good. But in reality, at the practical level, we are very, very close with them. Good. Thanks. Very helpful. Any other questions in the back? Thank you so much, Scotty. Greenwood Canadian American Business Council. Thanks for the program. Um, question for maybe Alex and Adam which is can you compare and contrast uh, how close we are, we the United States are with Canada on regulatory differences versus other trading partners around the world? Um, I've, I've heard that we're closer with Canada than others, but I'd be interested in your view. Um, and, and Bob, I guess same question for you with, with non-US partners, or is Canada looking at this sort of thing or is the US really the focus uh, for the time being? Thanks. So, um, and I think Bob laid this out well, the history, the, the nature of the economic relationship. We are uh, probably most compatible with the government of Canada when it comes to, to regulatory cooperation. Obviously with NAFTA, U US, uh, the U.S. and Mexico are strong partners. We have the High Level Regulatory Cooperation Council with Mexico. And there are other governments around the world that have very advanced uh, regulatory systems that, that facilitate the sharing of best practices. And uh, some of them are participants in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, there's the European Union, of course, and we have a longstanding uh, regulatory cooperation initiative, the High Level Regulatory, regulatory Cooperation Forum that was established in 2005, and that work continues. But again, frankly, when you look at the, the success factors, the lessons we've learned, and the importance of high-level leadership, uh, public participation, uh, having mechanisms in place that make regulatory processes transparent and participatory, uh, the U.S. and Canada are very compatible and uh, I think the, the logic is, uh, 
is very compelling, and, and that's why we have such a, an ambitious RCC action plan in place. And uh, I'm just looking forward to see how this, this plays out. I think potentially, uh, to the extent that we are successful, what the US and Canada do in the RCC could serve as a model between the US and other countries or other, other countries uh, cooperating um, between themselves. Thanks. I'll tackle that a little bit too. Um, so, uh, Scotty, to answer your question directly, our mandate right now is to work with the U.S. But certainly, um, as this exercise has progressed, we're um, certainly seeing this as being potentially a companion piece for uh, free trade agreements, those types of things as you move forward. And if you look at uh, Canada, U.S., we've already benefited from a, a longstanding free trade agreement in place, yet we still have these things at the border. Uh, and we still have these regulatory things that are creating unnecessary cost on industry. So we think that this would be an interesting companion piece likely to be considering as we move forward in, in other environments as well. Notwithstanding that, we are focusing on the U.S. right now. And we certainly see the U.S. as being a um, fully competent partner, obviously. And, uh, and they're seeking the same kinds of regulatory outcomes. And I was asked the question once, um, why would you look at the U.S., uh, why would the U.S. look at Canada more than anyone else? And I just had a quick list in my head about how would you rationalize that to someone? And I would say if a country has had uh, a regulatory s system in place for at least 20 or 30 years, if it's delivered by a federal, uh, federally across the nation, if it's got a professional workforce that is federally run, uh, if it's got uh, ongoing improvement and modernization exercises going on around those regulations, if there's third-party scrutiny, those kinds of things, we would be comfortable at least talking to them. But you'll see a number of countries in your mind dropping off the list as you walk through that. Um, so we think the U.S. is our best opportunity to do this laboratory experiment with at this point in time because there are like-minded people. We also benefit from the fact that our regulators know each other. Now, we certainly understand that right now there are those limits, as I mentioned before, in terms of authorities and, uh, and, and uh, policies and administrative requirements. We think we can probably work through some of those. There's also a series of traditions, conventions, uh, preferences, habits that we need to get by as well too. But that's what this exercise is all about, is exploring how we can do that. And there's no better partner, we think, that we could do that with than the United States. Um, so that's, that's where we're at on it. Thanks. We have a question up front. Hi, uh, I am Ed Wolking. I am with Detroit Regional Chamber, and I work with two groups that are very, very interested in the outcome of this. Uh, one is the Great Lakes Metro Chambers Coalition, and the other is the Binational Great Lakes Manufacturing Council. Uh, my question is this. Um, do you have a work plan similar to your other work plans for systematically reaching out to all of the stakeholders involved uh, uh, for input and feedback and uh, particularly uh, to the small and mid-sized enterprises who often uh, do not have the professional staffs to be able to engage on a proactive basis. And then secondly, uh, the corollary question is, as you uh, record your successes, will you call them out on your websites uh, very similarly to the way you called out your initiatives uh, in setting this RCC process uh, uh, Sailing. Thank you. Take one first. Sure. Go ahead. On engagement with stakeholders, each of the initiatives that are uh, mentioned in the RCC action plan, each has a work plan that's posted on the website that Adam mentioned. And we worked with the regulators to include in each of those plans uh, mechanisms for, for public engagement. So I think the answer to your question is yes, but there's not one single plan. They're embedded in the uh, action plan, work plans for each of the, the initiatives. Uh, totally agree with you on the need to um, include small, medium-sized enterprises, small businesses. That is uh, also embedded in, in both rulemaking systems where uh, at least on the U.S. side, we have the Regulatory Flexibility Act, the Office of Advocacy with an SBA who uh, 
who play an important role in facilitating uh, the solicitation of input from small businesses. So I think we can address that. I guess I would also just note that from a wireless perspective, we really are making sure that the regulators own this. And they each have well-established relationships with the stakeholders that um, are interested in, in their specific programs. There are established uh, FACA committees, listservs, and um, relationships that uh, predate the RCC action plan. And I think because the regulators are in charge of implementing the, the action plan, the, the, the work outlined in the action plan will be, uh, will be done in the way that they've been handling their, their regulations over the past years and, and decades. In terms of calling out successes, we, we, are, we, we are talking about how to uh, report out to the public uh, on the status of each of the initiatives. And not just know where we're being successful, but know where we may be behind schedule. Again, transparency is very important. We're just still working on what sort of uh, mechanism, what sort of, what the website would look like to, to make that information as accessible and useful to the public that wants to, to know how we're doing. The only thing I would add to that is um, we've been very active in going out to uh, and accepting, um, I think, all industry association uh, invitations to come out and speak, as well as regional groups as well. Uh, just in Minneapolis a couple of weeks ago where they had, a, I think it was 160 people that showed up at it uh, from all kinds of different um, uh, industries. So if there is an opportunity to do that on a regional basis, we would certainly try to build that into our schedules as well too. Uh, we are very interested in getting out to meet with as many businesses and as many people that are touched by this as possible particularly in those areas that are close to the border. Great. I think there's a question over there. Hi. <clears throat> the name is Matthew Sada. I'm with uh, U.S. Representative Gary Peters from Detroit. Actually, following up on both the last question and on Mr. Carberry's remarks, we want to thank you for sending someone out to the event that we did with the Detroit Regional Chamber on June 22nd. It was a combined Beyond the Border and Regulatory Cooperation Council presentation. And my question, I think, to the panel, or in also my comment, is that I think it's really important that we look both across these two initiatives and across our two countries and to figure out what we're doing well on one side and how that can be uh, relayed to the other. I mean, for instance, I think that DHS is in a great set of public outreach. I mean, if you go to the DHS website on the Beyond the Border, you can actually see that they've done 20 different outreach events in Canada, here in the United States. If you go to the RCC, on the other hand, you don't get that same sense of information. If you look at staffing, uh, RCC Canada has a great secretariat, you know, 16 people there. Um, go here to the U.S. side and you can see the numbers are a little bit smaller despite the fact, of course, the United States is a much larger economy. So again, comparing across the initiatives, comparing across the countries, I think is a very helpful exercise. Uh, Mr. Hunt, I heard you just make a comment about setting up a website. I would encourage the two governments to look at how we can do this jointly. I mean, I think it's interesting that the RCC, the BDP, the Canadians, the U.S., we have four websites going here. Isn't there some way that we can make this a little bit simpler for all involved and save costs and make it easier for the public to understand what's happening here? And the final point is, again, the complementary amongst these initiatives. I think it's best when these do complement each other, i.e. RCC and BTB. And I give as an example, rail. Both rails address both in the Beyond the Border and in the RCC, the Transportation Group. Congressman Peters is a strong supporter of restarting uh, high-speed rail from Chicago, Detroit, Quebec, Windsor, Quebec, all the way through the corridor. And on the Beyond the Border side, we can work on things like preclearance, but we need the cooperation on the RCC side as well. Mm -hmm. We need to ensure that, for instance, the locomotives can cross the border that the safety standards are the same, that would allow via rail trains to operate here in the United States and Amtrak trains to operate there, vice versa. So again, if you could comment a little bit about just how we are trying to complement these two initiatives and what could be done, for instance, to simplify, unify, perhaps creating one website to do all of this. Thanks. 
I think you had some great ideas and suggestions. Um, we we do have more than one website. I think that's uh, that's something we see not just in this area but uh, across government. Uh, what I would what I would say though is we we can make links between the websites. A joint Canada-U.S. website may be a bridge too far at this point. We haven't really discussed that. But our, our focus is on putting as much information online as possible if it's helpful, if there's interest in posting information about uh, stakeholder events that have happened. That That's a fairly easy thing that we can add to, to our, our websites. But this sort of feedback is very useful. Whatever we can do to make the work more transparent, more relevant, by pushing out information, giving you ideas about what sort of input into the process of implementing the, the action plan, I, I think that's, that's very useful. On coordination between the BTB and RCC, they are, the, on the Canada side, that is far more integrated. We now have a single official who will be heading up both efforts on the Canadian side and, and the U.S. We have more of a division of labor, but if and when there's an issue that's raised, if it's locomotives crossing the border, OIRA is very well positioned, particularly given the new executive order, to convene an interagency meeting to discuss those issues and uh, it's why I, I wanted to talk about that new executive order today is we do have a more formal framework for coordinating across government so that we're not working across purposes that were as fully coordinated as, as possible. The only remark I would make is um, we know there's a whole bunch of other really good ideas out there. We chose these 29 because there appeared to be a willingness on both sides of the border to actually move, and we will try to create solutions that can be applied in way more than 29 situations if we possibly can. Um, it's going to take some time for us to work through this. It took us decades to build the system we have now and the problems we have in it, so we're not going to fix it all within a two-year mandate, but we'd sure like to get an idea of how we're going to go about fixing it in a wholesale way by the end of the mandate. So that's where we're at right now. Um, how we're going to take other ideas on board, don't know yet. Um, we're going to uh, work through that over the upcoming months, but um, keep the ideas coming. Uh, don't don't be shy about sending to us so it's then on record and we have it, and at some point in time we'll be we'll be going through these things. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, and uh, just because uh, we want to keep things moving for the next session, uh, can you gentlemen give us your ideas for next steps? Uh, where does the initiative go from here? There was talk of a September program in Ottawa. Uh, what do you see happening in the future? Um, we don't think we'll be able to put one together in September, unfortunately. Uh, we are looking potentially at something uh, early in the new year. Uh, but that shouldn't be seen, those sessions shouldn't be seen as the key stakeholder engagement opportunity. That's not the idea. As Alex said before, uh, there should be ongoing engagement through the working group leads. We're willing to meet with anybody at any time uh, in our shop as well too to talk about where regulatory cooperation is going. What we do see over the next three or four months is a real opportunity for industry to engage at that working group level. And uh, we're welcoming that. Uh, we really need it. There's no way this initiative is going to go anywhere without industry support, stakeholder support, stakeholder interest. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot of work on our side as well to, uh, to examine what the tangible benefits are. We have about seven case studies that we're about to launch to look at various industries where we can uh, assume what we might be able to do on regulatory cooperation and then come up with real tangible benefits so that we can answer those questions over the next six or seven months as well. So we're going to be turning our attention to that in a very significant way. But uh, we really are asking for industry now to uh, step up, get involved, get your ideas on the table. There is a real opportunity for you there. I, I agree. The key next step is rolling up our sleeves and, and working on the, on the work plans that are now posted. It's, um, you know, it's more technical. It's getting into, into the weeds of, of the milestones and the deadlines in the, the specific work plans. We will convene at, at some point in the future uh, to, to look at the, the work uh, in the aggregate, but for the immediate future, uh, industry groups, uh, 
public advocacy groups, working with the with the agency leads on the specific initiatives is, I think, the, the most important area of focus. I just I would also ask that you um, keep the ambition high um, when you do those engagements. The ambition is laid out fairly clearly in the action plan and uh, reflected uh, to some degree in some of the rubrics in the work plan. So uh, keep that up there um, because uh, you know. The, when I looked at, at some of um, some of the ways we've done business in the past between Canada and the U.S., we've just really worked on different ways of pulling a healthy tooth. Uh, it's still painful, unnecessary, and expensive. Uh, so we're looking at ways of avoiding it altogether if we possibly can. So keep that in mind as you're doing those engagements as well. Thank you very much, Bob and Alex. And now if everyone uh, would wait, uh, we're going to change panels to our industry response panel. So thank you very much for your comments. Just a, a quick note, uh, David Adams of the Association of International Automobile Manufacturers of Canada cannot join us this morning. Unfortunately, his plane was canceled. Uh, also, if website viewers have any questions, please send them to Canada at WilsonCenter.org. I noticed during the last panel there was a lot of heads nodding in agreement uh, with everything that Bob and Alex said, which, which is great. And they mean everything about stakeholder engagement. It's up to the stakeholders to really support and drive this plan along. Please email them, contact them, go to the website, contact the, industry, the, uh, the initiative group leads. And we're looking forward to having uh, everyone's questions following this panel as well. Sure, we have a we have a great a great panel here right now uh, from industry representatives, uh, very uh, very experienced in the U.S. Canada space. Uh, so I'll start out on read uh, introduce all the panelists, and then I'll uh, turn to to Michael first to speak. So Michael Fitzpatrick is a senior manager and senior counsel for government and regulatory affairs at General Electric, where he leads where he helps to lead regulatory strategy and advocacy across GE's business groups, as well as on international regulatory cooperations and standards issues. Prior to joining GE, Mike, Michael served for almost three years as the Associate Administrator of OIRA, where he helped to lead the Obama administration's development of regulatory policy and White House review of significant executive branch regulatory actions. During his tenure as number two official at OIRA, Michael helped lead the Obama administration's efforts on international regulatory cooperation including developing and launching the U.S.-Canada RCC, the U.S.-Mexico High-Level Regulatory Cooperation Council, and serving as the administration's lead on the U.S.-EU High-Level Regulatory Cooperation Forum. Next to him is Gene Eckhart. He's a senior director for international operations for the National Electrical Manufacturers Association, that's NEMA. In this position, he is responsible for the development and implementation of programs that ensure market access for members, products, and countries and regions of importance to members. He works with local officials, designers, and contractors to better understand North American codes and standards and directs global strategy initiatives on regional and international electrical installation codes, product standards development, conformity assessment, and electrical inspection. On the panel, we also have Kelly Johnson. He's a vice president for government affairs at Campbell Soup Company. He's a founder, as he is a former chairman of the Canadian American Business Council. Kelly has long been active in US Canada trade issues and leads his company's participation in all aspects of the Beyond the Border Initiative, as he did with his predecessor, the Security and Prosperity Partnership in North America. Now based in Camden, New Jersey, he's also a former Secretary of the U.S. Senate and a former Deputy Assistant Secretary at the U.S. Department of Transportation. Finally, we have Brian Reed. He's a Vice President of XL Foods, which operates plants on both sides of the border. He has made a career in the meat industry, primarily the beef industry. Brian and XL Foods are full supporters of the RCC and an elimination of barriers at the U.S.-Canada border. With that, I'll turn it over to Michael. Thank you, Adam, and thank you to the Wilson Center for putting on this uh, important uh, event about an important initiative, the RCC, one that is uh, near and dear to my heart. And I applaud Bob and Alex and their teams for the extraordinary work that's been accomplished to date um, 
I certainly as now an external observer remain incredibly optimistic at the prospects that this council is going to yield tangible results in the next year and two and then into the future. And I'll start uh, before we get to the constructive comment phase of the presentation with a congratulations on uh, not only developing a robust action plan, but now having 29 work plans up. For those of you who haven't worked in government, um, you don't understand what the phrase 29 work plans posted online actually means. Um, it's, it's an incredible ach achievement, and uh, they should be applauded for it, uh, as well as the ambitious uh, scope uh, of, of these plans and of the RCC in general. Um, sort of trans uh, segueing over into the um, uh, constructive comment and um, cautionary um, uh, uh, cautionary uh, comment phase of my uh, remarks. Uh, I think there's three issues that the RCC really needs to keep its eyes on if it's going to achieve everything it can. And we're at that really tough phase of the process now where we actually need to do something as opposed to setting stuff up and thinking of great ideas and coming to consensus, which is a huge challenge. But now the results have to occur. And in doing that, this concept of sort of a public-private effort needs to be maintained. There really has to be real, robust participation by stakeholders. And what I worry about, and there's nothing concrete that, you know, animates my worry other than just in general my understanding of how processes work or processes, as Bob has, had gotten me to say for a while. Um, and, and it's that processes can sort of take on a life of their own and sometimes become insular. It's just human nature. And so I think there needs to be constant focus and attention to making sure that there are many opportunities for real input. And so let me talk quickly about three things. One is communication with the external world, with stakeholders and the public. Putting stuff online is not enough. Everything in the world is online now. And so it's almost like when you communicate by just putting stuff online, you're not communicating at all because no one knows that it went online. And much as we love the RCC, it's not usually what people check every morning. So they're not going to be checking, I, I don't think, various RCC websites or agency websites to see every day has something occurred that's important with, with regard to a working group or the RCC in general. So I would encourage um, both governments to really think hard about how they push information out. In this room today, you have several trade associations, for instance. You've got the chamber. I know the CABC on whose board I serve and Kelly serves, um, CME. And then in the specific working group areas, there are going to be trade associations who would love to be conduits for information and notices. And so I encourage you to link up with these and get information out. It has to be in plain English, it has to be understandable, and it's really got to direct and remind constantly the stakeholders as to where we are in the process and what they do next. Go here, call this person, here's a date, this is what we're doing, okay? So that's, that's the first thought. The second thought is, and it's a very closely related thought, is that the process for input has to be real. Uh, and here's where there's going to be an interesting kind of federal state um, issue going on. These guys are doing macro coordination of the RCC, and that's appropriate. There's no way that Bob and his team and Alex and, and, and the OIRA team with, you know, USTR and Commerce are going to be able to follow and, and sort of supervise the substantive developments in each working group, and it's frankly not in their expertise to do so. But I think the, 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 the centralized governments, the federalized government, the Prime Minister's office, the White House on each side have to keep the pressure on and supervise how the process is running. Are the working groups, is each of the 29 working groups sufficiently reaching out to stakeholders and providing real input uh, or opportunities for real input? How are they communicating? Are they meeting enough? And, 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 and I do think without, you know, volunteering folks for um, more work because each side is incredibly busy. Um, I think it's critical for accountability and effectiveness at the end of the day that stakeholders feel like they had a real chance to provide meaningful input and that it was listened to and it had an effect. My biggest worry is at the end of this, there's a work product produced for a working group that the stakeholders turn around and say, 
but 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 that's not good or it's not good it's not net good yes you did this and that but you've introduced four unintended consequences that are negatives that's what we want to avoid if at all possible because all that work may kind of go for naught um, and the last point is a process for um, well and let me just make one last point so there was a lot of talk about how the working groups have this now and they're the and, and that industry needs to step up and industry needs to provide input etc I agree but industry needs to be led through the process on how they can provide input and when and to whom and that means, in my view, the working group leads need to view as one of their chief responsibilities reaching out to stakeholders in a real way. Okay? Again, Alex and Bob and their teams can't be responsible for that for all 29 working groups, but they can be responsible for making sure that each working group leader understands that that is one of their prime responsibilities and that the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of Canada are going to be extremely unhappy if they don't fulfill that responsibility because that's the expectation. Finally, um, process for new ideas. Um, this, in my view, is, is the third critical component. This is envisioned to be not a one-off exercise, but something that is organic and continues into the future. And uh, as a result, there are <laughs> ideas out there that go beyond the 29 that occurred to people in the first tranche of comment that are now occurring to people because they're saying, hey, this RCC thing is pretty neat. Let's ventilate this through our company again and come up with ideas and now we're coming up with ideas that didn't make it into the first round. In, in order to have broad-based stakeholder support, there has to be a sense that stakeholders whose issues are not being addressed in the first 29 are going to have a path forward to have their issues addressed in versions 2.0 and 3.0. And so I know there's going to be thinking on this and maybe announcements, you know, in the new year. Um, on where RCC is going, but I, I really encourage the leaders on both sides to signal as early as possible when and how stakeholders are going to be able to provide new input into the process. Of course, we can always send it now, but I think people are less likely to put the effort into really constructing a proposal um, until they have a sense that it's going to be listened to and considered. So those are my thoughts. I hope they're helpful and look forward to any questions. Thanks. Uh, very, very helpful. Uh, Gene? Thank you, Adam. And uh, thanks to the Wilson Center and to the Chamber for uh, putting this, uh, this uh, session together. And also thanks to Alex and Bob for the, uh, the great lead off. You really um, teed it up well. Um, I, I'd like to speak um, um, as part of my day job here, uh, representing the electrical industry, and put some numbers behind all this. So when we looked at the electrical industry, for example, and on a tagline for every one of our press releases, we put, you know, $120 billion worth of products each year are sold domestically. Uh, Export-wise, uh, NEMA members export $40 billion a year. Canada and Mexico are number one and two, and they're running almost neck and neck, uh, each of them representing 25%, each of them. So eight plus billion to Canada, eight plus billion to Mexico. So this is a big, big deal, of course. Um, by and large, the electrical products in the U.S. and Canada are identical. You could very safely take any item in this room, and not just the <laughs> light bulbs and all, but the fixtures and all, take them up to Ottawa or take them up to Toronto. They would work perfectly. They would be reliable. They would be equally safe. So we have a fantastic harmonized system, if you will. And a lot of that has come about because of work done in the last 15 years directly as a result of NAFTA to harmonize voluntary consensus standards. The list now runs this long that the manufacturers make one product that can be used in both locations. Um, by and large, and, and we used to have a, uh, you know, a predecessor to mine who over and over again talked about how electrical products generally were not federally regulated. Um, they generally are not federally regulated, although every one of them that's used in the workplace comes under OSHA regulation. So of course they're regulated, right? And um, they're also regulated very much at the local level because every electrical installation that's made requires an inspection. So regulations come into play. Um, one of the points that I think, building upon what Michael was saying here a few minutes ago, is um, as this unfolds, not just with the 29 work plans that are in place now, but 
as the activity unfolds, we have to figure out a way to engage the non-federal regulators, the state and provincial, and even lower levels than that, because um, that's become one of the critical areas and real areas of impact for U.S. manufacturers sending product up into Canada. We see very well-meaning provincial uh, regulators coming up with something that's almost unique to their province or unique to their state, like the, the Republic of California or the Republic of Massachusetts. And of course it's not unique, so we have to maintain a vigilance in that area. I will say this, um, a, a really growing area of total federal regulation of electrical products in the U.S. and Canada is uh, energy efficiency. Virtually everything that has the possibility to lose some electrical energy and not deliver the light that it's trying to or the power out of the motor is coming under regulations now. Um, regulators responsible for those various products need, need to be vigilant to make sure that as they develop new regulations in the efficiency space or revise existing regulations, um, they must look across both borders simultaneously and not come up with a publication and then after the fact say, oh yeah, let's take a look around the neighborhood and see what's going on. Um, that's why um, we applauded the executive order that essentially I think builds upon the National Export Initiative that says um, everybody's in this game. Every regulatory agency is in this game right now of seeing what your regulations do to international trade. And then finally, um, I will just say that um, uh, uh, a big area of development and um, a lot of the harmonization we've done over the years was after the fact. As you mentioned in the introduction that the regulatory systems were put <coughs> together independently. That's the way it was for electrical products for 100 years more or less. They were developed independently. A new area of activity now is smart grid and that's a word that's on everybody's mind. And fortunately, we're ahead of the game on that. We have some very formal programs with the Department of Commerce of engagement with our counterparts in uh, Canada from the Industry uh, uh, Association, Electro Federation Canada, and others. So moving into the forward space, uh, we as an industry uh, intend to stay abreast or ahead of any potential regulations that might come out. So. We applaud your work as an industry. We think it's high time to keep pressing forward and developing a, a, a way or a mechanism to add new ideas and new new activities. Thanks very much. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Adam, thank you. David, thank you and the and Institute for allowing us to be here for having a session today. I also want to congratulate Alex and Bob as well. I mean, it's, uh, Michael's exactly right. This is a huge accomplishment. And I think what is most noteworthy for me is the amount of buy-in by, by separate agencies, both in the U.S. and Canada, this process that was not there, frankly, during the prior uh, iterations of these efforts to try to harmonize or in, in, try to enhance regulatory cooperation. So thank you and congratulations for the great work. Uh, I actually have uh, read, I think, 27 of the 29 uh, uh, plans. I haven't seen the last two, must be fairly new. So, And I would encourage you to go on the website and look at them because they're not that voluminous. They're actually pretty tight, very concise. They, they laid out kind of a process what's going to happen next with the timelines in most cases for this process. And I've got some three slides here, and I wanted to, as a way of my giving input on where we are with this so far, how we see it. And some of this is our slides that are, are old that, that kind of that give me a benchmark for how to measure forward. And then I want to conclude very briefly with just one very big challenge to those, those of us in the private sector because this process really isn't just about government. It's really about, about us who, who are engaged in commerce uh, across the border and for North America. Uh, I do think that, uh, again, I do remain enthusiastic about this. I think the lessons have been learned from the uh, SPP uh, previously. I think that the fatal flaws that were apparent that came out from the first process, which was really new, so it was a learning exercise, have been addressed. Uh, I do like the transparency. I do like the inclusiveness. I, I will want to associate my comments with uh, with Michael in terms of the uh, stakeholder process. I do think that what's been done so far, being online, is not enough. I do think we need a much more robust and engaged stakeholder uh, process. We do need to be led a little bit here and, and have more one-on-one -on -one or group engagement. Trade associations are valuable in this process. I know in my world of food safety, we have the Grocery Manufacturer Association here. 
They have a fabulous process working with the FDA on the new Food Safety Modernization Act. That can dovetail nicely into what's happening with the BTB on the food safety side of the RCC. So I want to mention that as well. I am grateful for the very strong leadership from the top, from the Prime Minister and the President. It's evident, it's obvious, and that's what it took uh, to make this work as well as it has so far. I'm a big fan of the time frame of three years, although I do hope this lasts longer. I mean, I do think for, as Michael said, 2.0 and 3.0 will happen eventually. But, you, but the process of, of incorporating deadlines to measure success is, uh, is really important. And I also I was uh, thrilled, Bob, when you mentioned the, uh, more integration between the RCC and the, and the border aspect, the people and goods. They do go together. This is a tremendous accomplishment that we don't see security and trade as separate, uh, if you will, even competing activities. So that is a huge accomplishment of this process uh, thus far. Now, this is an old slide, but I've got my updates in terms of what I, how I'm measuring success for this so far. Uh, I had hoped that industry would be part of working groups. It gets to what Michael was said in his comments. No, but we do have a very robust input process. I do think that, that we're all s submitting comments. We submitted comments uh, uh, as, uh, early when this thing was just getting developed, and we haven't heard a whole lot back yet, but I know it's in the mix. So I do think we have to go to the next step on the, on the stakeholder process. I also, uh, uh, we had hoped that, that the focus would be on trying to make sure that, that instead of trying to rewrite and, and make the regulations the same, there at least would be some equivalency. This program absolutely does that. Uh, I would love it if, if in my world, uh, I mean, talk about being ambitious, Bob, if I can. I would love, much like in, in defense procurement, Canada is seen as a domestic supplier to the U.S., but for food, it's not. Um, so, for, at least for U.S. procurement purposes, uh, I would love to see that uh, concept advanced in, in my world. That may happen, we'll see, but that's early, I realize that. I do want to say there was, has been a regulation that's been changed in Canada. Uh, uh, I want to credit the, the Beyond the Border process for making this happen because it was the input that we helped provide for this that has resulted in Canada eliminating its container can size regulation, uh, which, uh, uh, which will make, I think, cross-border trade more effective. So I want to applaud the, the Prime Minister and, and our Canadian friends for making that first step because that tells me that this process already has resulted uh, in, one, in one significant change for a segment of the food uh, industry. But I also want to show you one slide, too, that tells another story. And this is a challenge not to my government friends, but to my private sector friends. This is a photograph from my uh, company's Toronto facility. Uh, it's located between the Pearson Airport and downtown Toronto. And what you see here are two stacks of pallets. You'll notice there is a little Canadian flag on one side and a U.S. flag on the other. Now, that's not because of a government regulation. It's because Canadian retailers like one kind of pallet and U.S. retailers like another kind of pallet for a plant that supplies both the U.S. and Canadian markets. So, folks, let's not just rely on our friends in government. We have some work to do in the private sector as well on this. And I would encourage those of you in the trade association world to think about how we dovetail and build on this effort and do our own things so we achieve what Bob talked about is improving economic competitiveness for North America. Thanks very much. Thank you, Kelly. Brian? Thank you very much, Adam. I always find this a humbling experience. As you can see, my bio is really short, but uh, we'll, give it, we'll give it a shot. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Alex and, uh, and Bob and, and Adam as well for your, for your kind words and your, and your go forward words. I think that's really important because from an industry standpoint, we're excited about this. And before I move on too far, I'd like to thank Wood, 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 Woodward for the welcoming he, me here. And last night as well, there was a Canadian awarded in Washington with a high honor of degree. I'm not sure the name of the award, but Bridget re received an award here in Washington from our Canadians on her work in trade. So we, we should applaud Bridget for, for her grand award that I'm obviously envious of. Thank you, Bridget. <laughs> When I first heard about this, I think we were dragged down here to Washington, and it's always exciting to be here as a small Canadian. It's, uh, it's a big, powerful city, and we know where we are right away, and we appreciate this honor. But when I look at this, this is probably one of the biggest steps forward since the 90, 1988 FTA agreement between the two countries. And it's up to industry and government, the regulators, not to burden this, but to make it move. Industry in the meat industry, which I'll speak for, We've had three meetings. They've been hosted by AMI, Canadian American Meat Institute, 
Bill Weissman, we'd like to thank you for all your efforts to date, and the Canadian Meat Council, and they've been totally transparent. We've in invited the regulatory bodies, both the AF USDA, APHIS, FSIS, as well as USDA, or CFIA, and they have been present at all our meetings. And they've been part of the work plan that we have just completed as of last night. So Bob, to your first request, here's the, <laughs> the work plan going forward from the meat industry. That's how important it is. We have a, we've also, between the two countries, food safety is declared a non-competitive issue. And I think that's important because at the end of the day, that's really what we're doing this all for is our consumers and our taxpayers. We see the border as a burden. Uh, we see it dated, uh, and there's an opportunity to improve this drastically, to improve the flow of food between the two countries. As you all know in this room, I'm sure you do. If you don't, I'm about to tell you. Beef exports to the United States, Canada is your number one customer. So there, it is a two-way trade. So, and, we, and we do respect each other's food safety systems, so equivalency is there. It's just a matter of now of us recognizing it. We need the senior bureaucrats on both sides of the border to push this through. Reinspection just adds nothing but cost and burden. Again, it's not a competitive issue. It's just making our consumers having the cheapest food possible without delay. Uh, we are in the midst of putting costs together for the border delays. I know from a plant in Canada, it's excess of $1.2 million on an annual basis, and it does nothing except delay the process. And we, we have HACCP programs in the plants now or food safety programs in the plants. We've added layers of food safety inspectors, both regulatory as well as, no, as same as Campbell's has, and we wish we were where the electrical industry is for sure. Uh, and all we've done is add layers and cost. Uh, so I think it's time we have a serious look at it. We have September 5th dated. That date Sounds like it could be waffling a bit, but we look forward to sharing that work plan and uh, fine-tuning it. I'm going to stop there to take questions. No problem. Thank you Thank very you. much. All right, so, uh, Bob or Alex, do you have some of your work here? Okay. I'm going to turn uh, right to the audience. Uh, anyone have any questions? Yeah. Good morning, Rachel Pfeffer, Department of Commerce. Um, thank you all very much for participating today. Thank you to Woodrow Wilson Center, to Alex and Bob, and everyone else who's participated. Um, Mr. Reed, you touched on a bit about your, the engagement you've had with the, th the three meetings that your industry has had with <coughs> regulators. And I'd actually be keen to hear from the other panel participants about your companies or trade associations, how apart from these larger stakeholder meetings, have you been able to get involved in the process for the different work plans? Well, I, I mean, when this process really began with your agency back in April, I think, of last year when you all asked for comments about what we could do, and that was a kind of our benchmark document, and much, I will be very candid, and much of that was based on what we submitted previously as part of the Security and Prosperity Partnership that never really got addressed. Uh, so we, yeah, we did bring up some uh, previous stuff with a few more items. Since then, I, we, we were engaged in the January stakeholder sessions. Uh, there have been other association and other uh, sessions. I will say that, the, uh, in fact, Mr. Hunt was a host of a meeting that I was engaged in a few weeks ago. Uh, we've had ongoing dialogue uh, with officials uh, uh, and uh, provided as much input as we can. We haven't had a lot of questions to follow up what we've been asked for yet. I think we're eager to find out what exactly uh, the the uh, working groups would like from us. I know I've I've told my folks, for example, in Toronto, at our plant, uh, please be prepared to provide some real serious cost information. And they said, well, let us know what exactly you need, and I'll make sure we get it to you. So I think we're poised, and we've got teams of people at my company who are ready to submit data based on precisely what, what the agencies and what the, uh, the working groups really need. So, and I think that's probably true for other companies as well, and I think the associations are really the place that we're going to rely on to help coordinate that. So uh, it, it can't be just one company in my case. We've got a lot of companies that do, I can name six or seven that have as much, if not more, cross-border uh, integration and engagement than, than my company does. 
but I think between what we can provide and what our associations, GMA in particular, can provide, uh, we can do a lot more, and we will. But yeah, I think so far we've appreciated the input, we've submitted uh, the comments, we've, we've been attending meetings, and then we're poised to go to the next step. Hey, Scotty Greenwood again, Canadian American Business Council. Thank uh, another great panel. Um, I have a couple of questions, if, if, you, if I may. Um, Kelly on food, congratulations on uh, can size uh, harmonization. Did it, I want, wondered if it, um, if, if you know if it worked for baby food as well or if that's still in the works. It really benefits the baby food industry, I Jar think, size more is harmonized as than well. most parts of the segment. I mean, it's, it's a minor factor for my company because it's Dell's, uh, just to, not to bore you all, but it has, it's regulation in Canada that prescribed the size and dimension for uh, fruit and vegetable products uh, that in Canada. And baby food fell in the category, and uh, we're not in the baby food business, but, but I understand that's where the biggest impact was. It's a big was. deal, yeah. And it will provide them, for example, in America, for where most of us here live, we're used to single-size baby food. I haven't dealt with baby food in about 20 years, but, <laughs> but they, that are, their single size were in Canada much larger containers and a little bit less convenient for a consumer. So this will allow Canadian consumers to get the same benefit in portion size, package size that current U.S. consumers have. That's, now that's, this, the, that's I huge, think actually. Yeah, that's yeah. big. Okay, second question on food, and then I have one other question. So the, the second question on food is um, our great friend Ambassador Jacobson likes to talk about Cheerios, mm -hmm. um, and his officials always cringe because they say, bad example, oh, we're not going to fix Cheerios in this round. Um, and I don't know if anybody could comment on it, but the issue is the vitamin and mineral fortification regime in Canada different than the United States, and so Cheerios – taste slightly different and I I'm just wondering if anybody in the room has insight as to why are why is that untouchable uh, when you're able to fix jar size and well, just hang on for one sec let me sure. ask my other question then I'll give away the microphone um, today Congress is receiving a report from the Federal Maritime Commission uh, which is a US federal agency that has to do with uh, cargo uh, diversion to to Canadian ports of U.S. bound cargo, it's it's going to um, say a lot of things. I think uh, I've read um, mm -hmm. about Canadian ports versus U.S. ports. It's it's directly contrary to the vision the President, the Prime Minister set forth in terms of perimeter security, border cooperation, et cetera. And so I'm, I'm only asking this uh, to see, is there a thought, besides stakeholder engagement, which I totally agree with, uh, being important and needing to step it up, uh, as well as stakeholders stepping up, how about Congress? Is anybody thinking about how, how we talk to them um, so that, that this administration or future administ administrations don't get smacked back with mm. uh, various bills that are contrary to the vision set forth in, by the leaders? So Cheerios in Congress. Thanks. Uh, Scotty, I'll be glad to, to try to tackle a little, at least a part of your Cheerios question. Uh, we are similar. Our company does V8 juice, and we have fortified V8 in the U.S. We don't have fortified V8 in Canada, although Health Canada has changed its process recently. We're now on a case-by-case -case basis. They're considering uh, fortification of certain products. So it's not exactly the same as the U.S. where the Food and Drug Administration has long established guidelines on what companies can do. The USDA has a different policy that they're now revisiting because you can't fortify USDA products where you can FDA products but with exceptions. And now Canada's kind of got a third model and that's one of the things that we hope will be looked at uh, down the road and I think it is, it's in the queue. Now where, when it will be addressed I think will uh, yet to be determined. I defer to Bob and to Alex and their groups on that one. Uh, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll answer that and let somebody else answer the other one if they would like. Anyone want to tackle no. Congress? Well, oh, you know what? I, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I will answer Congress because <laughs> I, I agree with you, Scotty, and I've been advocating. In fact, one thing I've been thrilled at is the congressional reaction to this so far. I mean, bipartisan. You've got Bill Owens from New York, a border state congressman who's been been very uh, strong in support of this. I know we've got members from Michigan, a Democrat and Republican, who've been very su uh, supportive of this, Homeland Security Committee, other committees. So, but I agree with you totally that there needs to be, we need to make sure Congress is, is very much engaged because one of the things that, that I would like to see, uh, and I think it's, it's, it's one of the elephants in the room in this process, is that many of these regulations that need to be addressed have their roots in public law. But laws passed by Congress. One very big example, it's not entirely relevant to this, 
You see 100% cargo screening requirement. That was created by Congress. That's not something that can be fixed by regulation. It's a bad law, in all candor, for a bunch of reasons. Uh, so I do think that part of this process needs to address, at least to tee up, not, not to try to fix, but say, here are some regulatory challenges to economic competitiveness that we've identified, but they're going to require changes by, in law for Congress. I think that would be an enormously helpful part of the process for this, this effort. I would just add as well, um, on the legislative aspect of this, and this probably applies in Canada as well, the more these principles and these efforts take root here, the more they become part of the way we think in the executive branch and in the regulatory domain, I think there's a spillover effect into the legislatures. There's, there is constant communication going on between um, authorizing committees and oversight committees and the agencies and obviously the White House. There's support on the Hill for these efforts. They have not become contentious politically in our legislative branches and they've been generally supported. And so I think the more we institutionalize this idea that when we make policy we need to think about the international implications and avoid unnecessary divergence, you'll see a higher awareness or heightened awareness on, on the legislative side. Having said that, there's always going to, there are always going to be legislative initiatives that are motivated for a variety of reasons, some of which may be contra to the principles of this and we just have to have to watch for those. Um, I think your Cheerios example, Scotty, simply puts an exclamation point on the importance of version 2.0 whenever it moves forward. There are issues that we already know about now or that we're going to think of in the next three, six months and thereafter. And I, it, it seems very important to me that we have a sense and a process for introducing those, at least for consideration. There has to be an awareness on industry's part that not every idea is going to meet this sweet spot where you're not lowering protections. You get agreement on both sides of the border from the regulators that there's an achievable um, result um, that improves regulatory efficiency. And that's always going to be a subset of the ideas offered. But there's, there's plenty of ideas that we haven't thought of yet. Yeah. Just a quick follow-up. Um, to underscore something you said, Michael, and, and for the benefit of our um, friends in government that are in the room, you know, I think it's as important to have case studies is a great idea to define a narrative, um, to talk about why we chose the 29 points we chose. I, I do think it would be useful um, for building confidence for the stakeholders and industry in particular going forward to when you decide not to take something on, when w mm. the reasons when something uh, did not make the list. Uh, it would be good to have an honest, direct, it doesn't have to be in a forum like this, but sometimes somewhere somebody needs to explain out loud um, what the rationale was for not including it, just too hard, entrenched interest, trade irritant, whatever the heck it is. Um, because otherwise I think it's difficult to go to industry and say, give us your wish list, give us your next uh, big group of ideas, because industry, particularly if you're not in the food industry or in the automotive industry, mm. uh, which are favorites of this process, and I'm for that, two important industries, you might be a bit skeptical. And if your ideas didn't get handled, why you would spend the resources internally to go back and identify more until you understand, I'm sure there are very good reasons Cheerios didn't get handled. I just don't know what they are, and, and nobody's told me. Thanks. All right, and we have time for one more question. Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, Bill Weston, American Meat Institute. Uh, just a couple of comments. First of all, Brian is very good at, uh, at thanking people, and I'd like to thank him also publicly because he's been involved in this process at Excel Foods as well as uh, Jim Laws, our counterpart at KB Meat Council. Mm -hmm. But two lessons we've learned is that regulators are very good at regulating and enforcing the law. And mm -hmm. what we've learned is we have to present to them our proposals and how to work through RCC and through uh, you making these changes. And that model, I think, has worked very well in terms of our interaction with them and how we work together. And the second thing is We've had our Mexican counterparts involved mm. right with us all along in the meetings and the conference calls and so forth because we want to take what we've learned with Canada and turn to Mexico and address those issues. So that, that model, I think, is also working very well. So thank you very much. Great. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. I would appreciate everyone coming today. Uh, we've had a very productive session. It sounds like uh, there's been calls for input from stakeholders and in and uh, more work from the stakeholder side, but also in turn,
how is that information best structured? How is that information best provided? Uh, so both sides have some work to do moving forward to make this really achieve the, the high uh, ambitious goals that we put forth, but it's definitely realistic. Uh, I'd like to thank the Woodrow Wilson Center, and I'll turn it over to David for quick closing. And actually, this one. Just thank you again all for coming, and thanks for those who came from a distance. I think there are a lot of good ideas put forward, a lot of forward momentum here, and I really thank the speakers for, for, for doing that, for really looking forward and not just looking what we've done, um, and really encouraging people to be involved in the process. Um, we hope to be a part of it, and I hope you will too. Um, if you don't know who to get in touch with, get in touch with us, and we'll help you get in touch with these folks. So thank you very much for coming, and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.